All right, so last, why is it looking like this? Hang on. This is weird. Escape. Okay. That's better. Okay, so last time uh, I had started to talk about the advantages of and the use utility of dinosaur trace fossils, and I'll keep I'll wrap that up, and then we'll move into the broader issue of biomechanics and functional morphology in dinosaurs. So trackways, I, fi I finished up. Trackways, of course, are a succession of tracks on an individual footprint. And they have data in it, like pace length, that's left to right, or right to left. Or the longer one, stride length, that's left to left, or right to right. And these are some of the data that we can actually take from a trackway. And it turns out they're useful um, in interpreting aspects of, for instance, locomotion. So we can't see the animal moving itself, but we have a record of its motion, um, even without the raw data, we can get information from trackways that we otherwise otherwise might not get. So here is a case of a track site in East Asia. Um, it has a series of dromaeosaur tracks. And we know the dromaeosaurs, or at least dinonychosaurs, because uh, it's, two, it's digits two and four, uh, three and four contact in the ground, and the base of that hyperextendable second digit only the base is there, not the full toe. So the, the, the sickle claw is held above the ground. They're big tracks are the size of, almost the size of, of, of Utah Raptor, the largest one known by bony skeleton. And they're on the same surface as the trackway of an iguanodontian. And they're all headed in the same direction. So it is consistent with the possibility of a pack of dromaeosaurids chasing a herbivore. It is not a demonstration per se. We don't actually see them interacting. But the tracks are of similar quality, so they were made when that surface was about the same level of dryness. Um, and they're all headed in the same direction, so that's useful. But even more useful is we can do math. Don't worry, don't write down the equation. Uh, <laughs> not gonna have you calculated it. Um, but by a sort of a variation of the pendulum equation, by incorporating stride length, um, so the, uh, the lambda there is stride length. Um, and h is the height, that is the height at the hips. We can figure out or approximate how quickly the organism, the dinosaur in this case, was moving when it was making its tracks. Um, and so we can go, go to particular slabs with particular fossils on it. And so here is a trackway of uh, a young Tyrannosaurus from out in the Lance Formation, latest Cretaceous of uh, Wyoming. And the, track, the trackway, the estimates are between about 8.1 and 12.5 meters per second. What does that mean? Well, we'll talk more about absolute speeds coming up in a bit. Um, and the individual involved is something about the same size as this specimen, famous specimen, Sue. I'm sorry, sorry, Jane, the young, a younger Tyrannosaurus. So trackways can give us a lot of information, but there are some difficulties. For one thing, it's often dif difficult to assign footprints to a particular genus. So in that one case, it was a tyrannosaurid track from the latest Cretaceous of Western North America, where most of us agree there's a single species, so that made it a little easier. Uh, but in many cases, we don't, uh, uh, we don't have that level of, of of ability to narrow down. Uh, if our goal is to try to figure out, as I'll talk about in the, the upcoming part of the lecture, the maximum speed, rather than the speed they were making at one particular occasion, it's very unlikely tracks are going to record that. Because in order for a track to form, it has to be a soft, muddy surface. If it's a drier surface, you don't leave tracks. And just think about that. When you're walking along on an ordinary surface, you're not generally leaving tracks, particularly the environment in which you could move the fastest. So uh, the trackways will give us real numbers of a real set of locomotion, but that's unlikely to be a maximal speed if that's what we're interested in. And not all dinosaur groups are currently known from trackways. Um, we don't necessarily have tracks from every formation from which we have dinosaur fossils. 
that it's worth pointing out that although we normally think about tracks as being a record of locomotion, sometimes they're a record of rest. And so on this red track here, so there's a big surface with lots and lots of different dinosaur tracks on it. There we are. The one in red is one individual of a dilophosaur type, dilophosaur grade um, theropod. But notice right here, something a little different going on. It's not just walking along. And when it's looked at close up, we see it's a resting track. It's sort of a settling and resting track of this dinosaur. And what we see is, first of all, in blue, is when it first settled down. We get its butt print. So ischiatic impression, that's the base of the ischium. Uh, by the way, in German, the ischium has a, a colloquial name, because it's not, we don't just use, in German, uh, they don't just use necessarily the, um, uh, the formal Latin name. Just like in English, we say thigh bone or, or femur, shin bone for, um, uh, for the tibia. Well, in German, the sitzbein, the, the sitting bone, is the ischium, and that's the impression of it. And in blue are the feet, but notice the feet show not just the toes, but also the metatarsals. Now, you remember, dinosaurs are degenerate. They don't walk with the metatarsals on the ground. What's happened is it's, like sometimes you can watch your cat or your dog sort of hunker down, and it brings its metatarsals down on the ground while it's resting. These guys did the same thing. And then in blue, the manis impressions. And it shows that, as we know from the anatomy, most dinosaurs were clappers, not slappers, uh, that their hands faced inward. And that even happened when they sat down on the ground. And then it sort of shuffled forward a little, because we see a second set of a butt print and footprints. You can even see a little drag mark from the one toe as it pulled it forward. And then it got up, we don't know how much longer, and started walking again. So that's kind of cool. And there's a restoration of this stylophosaur sitting down on the ground. We even, you know, it's not the only dinosaur resting trace. Here's a, a resting trace from an uh, Italian ornithomimosaur. Um, you can see a little track there, and that's sort of a restoration of how that track formed. So that's kind of cool. When we talk about pterosaurs later on, I'll try to remember, we actually have a pterosaur landing track, which is really damn cool. Um, okay, we have burrows. They're a type of trace fossil. So orodromine, um, Ornithopods are the one group of ornithopod, or one group of dinosaur, of not even dinosaur, for which we're uh, confident we're diggers. And so you can find these burrows. The way we recognize them is that the sediment inside the burrow is different than the sediment all around it. So it dug a hole in it, and then later other sediment came in to fill that hole. And within that hole, there are the bones of young individuals. And it was probably a nest, or den, I suppose you could call it. Another very uh, another uh, type of trace fossil are bite marks. So bite marks made by dinosaurs on other dinosaurs. Uh, they tend to be relatively rare in dinosaur bones until Tyrannosaurids appear. They're, they're present. For instance, this is this is Camarasaurus, so this is a Jurassic dinosaur with bite marks on it. So we know that big theropods made bite marks earlier on. But when Tyrannosaurids show up, they become a lot more common. Anyone want to speculate? Why? Yes? Bite, bite forces, yes. So remember, tyrannosaurids have these stronger bite forces and these thick end teeth, these incrassate teeth that are better built for smashing into bone. Um, and here, for instance, this is the delta pectoral crest of a, a sorolophus, a big hadrosaurid. Um, and it's got bite marks, and actually it's got a variety of style of bite marks, probably from the same individual of tyrannosaur, uh, the same individual of tyrannosaurus that was using different types of teeth in different uh, parts of feeding. Because remember, they have those incisor-like front teeth and the big crunching side teeth. Or here, the specimen of Triceratops with these scalloping in the bone, probably from multiple bites by a Tyrannosaurus. But it's not just um, dinosaurs that like bite marks. Other animals were in their environment. They weren't all alone. Uh, there were crocodilians, including some very large crocodilians, in the uh, world of dinosaurs. And although this is a smaller scale one, this is uh, are some ornithopod bones that show not merely the puncture holes in them, 
but also the broken tooth tip of crocodilians that had been munching on this critter. This is a meter scale, so this gives you the sense of the animal. This is about our size or so. So not surprisingly, a crocodile, you know, maybe the size of a Nile crocodile, maybe even smaller than that. And even very tiny creatures can leave bite marks. So repeated bite marks on dinosaur bones from mammals. Now, this isn't like tiny little mammals leaping up and, and attacking the throat of dinosaurs and taking them down, like the rabbit in uh, Monty Python and the Search for the Holy Grail. Um, this is after the dinosaur's dead and its bones are exposed. It's like you can go out to um, in the woods or whatever nowadays, and you can find bite marks on bones from squirrels and so forth. Now, squirrels are not carnivores, that's not typically, they're, they are herbivorous, but a lot of animals um, need a little extra calcium and phosphorus from time to time, and one way to do that is to little, scrape little bits of bone off of uh, corpses that are out there, and that's what these little marks are. This is a type of mammal, we'll encounter me uh, mesozoic mammals towards the end of the course, called a multi-tuberculin, a very common mammal at the time. I talked before, when I talked about the pachycephalosaurs, about the lesions on some of their heads. So this is a sort of trace fossil that's actually found on the body fossil. And it's a trace fossil of the behavior of headbutting. So uh, pachycephalosaurs smashing their heads or pressing their heads into each other on, with enough force to actually generate lesions on their head. And the white arrows are pointing to those. And they tend to be concentrated on the domes of dome-headed dinosaurs. Or dinosaur on dinosaur uh, damage. That's actually from the uh, herbivore on the carnivore. So remember, stegosaurs characterized by this thagomizer, this pair of tail spikes at the end. We have multiple bones, from, especially from the Morrison Formation, the late Jurassic of Western North America, that seem to be thagomizer wounds. Um, in this case, this is the pubis of an allosaurus. That's what this is uh, supposed to represent, the creation of this uh, specimen. Uh, apparently, the phagomites are pierced through the pubis bone, and uh, the, the allosaurus lived, but probably wasn't happy about it, and there's a, an abscess that formed um, as uh, the wound was healing. Now, another type of trace fossil um, is what's called, what are called gastroliths, or gizzard stones. Uh, many modern, well, both living groups of archosaurs, crocodilians and birds, swallow stones, rocks, that are used in the stomach region. In the case of birds, that part of the stomach has actually become a non-digestive part called the uh, gizzard. And they're used for multiple things. One main one seems to be to help grind up the food as it gets in there. And gastroliths have been found on a variety of dinosaurs from all three major plates, sauropodomorphs, ornithischians, and theropods. So here they are in the primitive ceratopsian cetacosaurus. Uh, and it, they're not simply in herbivores, as I mentioned today, modern crocodilians have them. The giant marine plesiosaurs, which were fish-eating reptiles uh, of the Mesozoic, also have them. People think maybe they're in part for ballast, but they may have been helped to, uh, to grind up food. Um, so, yeah, it's, they're a record of the behavior. They're not actually part of the body of the organism because they're ordinary stones. And then, speaking of the digestive system, there are coprolites, as I talked about before, poo, and they tell us something about the digestion of the animals. For instance, in this Tyrannosaurus rex poo, um, it's got the partially digested, shattered remains of young ornithischians. And this is Dr. Karen Chin and part of her collection of coprolites she's studying. And I showed this in the, um, I think the first, or one of the first lectures. It is a regurgitalite, that is a vomitite, from Truodontid. And within it, and within this mass, are the bones of a Mesozoic mammal. And it shows us that uh, Truodonts, at least in part, eat small body prey rather than big prey. My uh, shoelace again. All right, so now we're going to move on to other types of evidence of locomotion, as well as other types of behavior. So the Dinosaurian Olympics, locomotion, and dinosaurs in the world of physics. There you go. So 
How do we interpret dinosaur biology in general? Well, there's a couple of different approaches. There are some aspects where, of course, we can see the direct evidence um, on the fossils. These are aspects of the skeleton, of the teeth, sometimes soft tissue. Other cases, we can find and interpret what's going on in terms of soft tissue, not because that tissue is preserved, but because it has osteological correlates. That is, there is some feature in the bone that correlates, that, that corresponds to those soft tissues. Or, or other, you know, so like aspects of the eye capsule or the nose capsule. We'll talk about those when we talk about senses. Or muscle attachments and so forth. But we can also use measurements, here's one of my colleagues talking about the importance of measuring, um, use measurements of the materials that remain, and maybe of stuff that we can infer from osteological correlates, to work out the physics, the, the actual mechanics of the situation. And so we can use the science of mechanics or related studies in order to interpret dinosaur biology. Now, more broadly, um, that's part of the bigger set of ways that we interpret dinosaur and other extinct animal biology. This is the classic method, the oldest method, analogies with modern animals. So, you know, we find herbivores with long, neck in the, long necks in the modern world, and we can look at examples in the extinct world, like the sauropod. It's not always the safest way of doing it, but it's sort of a first approach. It at least kind of set up hypotheses to test. Another one is phylogenetic distribution of traits. So if we find a behavior or a um, other attribute that's present in the two living group of groups of archosaurs, the simplest inference is all other things being equal, that extinct members of this clade, like dinosaurs, would have had that trait. Again, this isn't perfect. And when I talk about eggs and babies, we'll talk about some new information that shows in one particular aspect of reproduction uh, that what we in initially perceived by simple phylogenetic distribution of traits may be more complex. Then the main subject of what I'm talking about today, biomechanics, in this case, this is looking at reconstructing the skulls of carnivorous dinosaurs with different aspects of mechanical loading and showing that tyrannosaurids are more awesome than other theropods. Uh, showing that tyrannosaurids have a greater mechanical strength in all three senses, so side to side, up and down, and twisting, than other large carnivorous dinosaurs. And then what I just sort of recently just finished talking about, which is sedimentological and trace fossil record. And we'll see that we can use this not just for general biology, we'll see behavior in lectures to come, how we can use these attributes. So let's move over to the world of biomechanics and modeling. Modeling sometimes that involves actual <laughs> plastic models, but more often is some sort of mathematical model. So one issue, trying to figure out the range of motion of the different joints. And you might think it's a simple enough thing. You, you've got the joint surface on one bone. You have its corresponding joint surface on another bone. And then you can approximate how far the joint can move. That's a, not, not a bad first approach, but it's worth noting that it's not bone-on-bone -bone contact, at least not in healthy individuals, that's really going on. It's um, cartilage on cartilage. So the cartilage that covers the end of each bone. And that's not always a one-to-one -one copy of the bone underneath. But since the cartilage doesn't always preserve, it is difficult to say for certain what the actual cartilage shape was that controlled the range of motion. So this is not a bad first approximation, but it should be taken with an appropriate grain of salt. Oh, so here's the range of motion of the forelimbs on a couple of dromaeosaurs. Those are fingers of dromaeosaurs. Um, and then back here showing the scale of cartilage that's inferred on a giant sauropod, that's shown to scale of a human being, uh, in terms of what the actual joint surface probably was. 
So this can give us very different results depending upon you know, how much give or take we give at the, uh, at the joint surfaces. There was a debate, a strong debate going on in the latest 20th and early 21st century about the range of motion of sauropod necks. And some early biomechanical studies suggested that most sauropods held their necks out mostly horizontally based on their interpretation of the range of motion at the joints. But additional work uh, that incorporated uh, more information from living organisms and estimates of the flexibility at each of these joints suggested that the old-fashioned model of sort of the swan neck may actually be the superior model for most groups of sauropod. But this is showing me sort of the old, limited uh, range of motion. Okay. A huge field of study, and it's a huge field for two major reasons, is the study of bite forces. Why is it so such a big part of biomechanics? Well, for one thing, it involves parts of the body that preserve pretty well, skulls and teeth. So, you know, it's a lot easier to deal with that sort of situation than it might be for other sets of biomechanics. But there's another major aspect, and that is bite forces and biting in general as a critical part of animal biology. You know, how do they interact with their food? Uh, what is the trophic uh, relationships and so forth, and, and what sort of food do they eat? So there's been a lot of attempts to reconstruct the feeding in different sorts of dinosaurs. So what sort of techniques are used? Old-fashioned ways to make a physical model, you know, that you could actually compress into something, uh, you know, uh, try to replicate the properties, see what bite, what bite forces they generate. Um, then there were sort of general mathematical models uh, where, you know, you take a few measurements and work a little beam theory. But the most sophisticated level are computer models. I, the mathematical models are, in a sense, computer models, but it's a computer model on something like Excel. Whereas the computer models I talked about there are using techniques from more sophisticated engineering. If you're engineers, you may know about this like, finite element analysis, where you take a 3D reconstruction of an object, you know, whether it's a building or a plane wing or a skull, and reconstruct it as a series of little polygons with properties that you assign to it, mechanical properties, and then you put it, you load it under what are hopefully realistic loadings, and see what the, where are the strong spots, where are the weak spots, and you know, where the strain build up, what's the maximum forces you can generate, and so forth. And so people have been doing that from a variety of different dinosaurs. So this, for instance, is feeding in Stegosaurus. Now, one thing you can do in a computer model is you can gigantically exaggerate some aspects of it so that the human eye can see it. So they, they are not arguing that the skull of Stegosaurus flex anything like this. I believe it's like, this is a hundred times the level of motion, but it's easier to see. And then you can see where the strain is loading up with these different warmer colors. And you can actually, you know, incorporate, not even just, not even with simply these big computer models, but the more simple mathematical models, of the loading of forces in different parts of the skull and look at chain and incorporate that into phylogenies to try to understand the evolution and the change of different situations. So in this case, it was a study from uh, last year looking at herbivory in different clades of dinosaurs and uh, the team found sort of two different pathways. Um, among sauriscians, herbivorous sauriscians, whether they're sauropodomorphs or herbivorous theropods, there tends to be very little oral mastication, so very little chewing going on, and most of the digestion is going on in the gut. And in contrast, their models showed that ornithischians had a lot of mastication, that is, chewing. Now, that's not a big surprise. We talked about that in the diversity section, but it's always nice to see it confirmed. And what they can even show even, uh, show even more so is the degree to which these processes get enhanced, you know, the lever arms and so forth, over the course of the history of these groups. Or in my part of the tree, you know, how we could look at 
These are the bending forces of the lower jaw as an estimate of mechanical strength. How at small body size, tyrannosaurs, which are in the, the grayish circles, are comparable to some other theropods, but after they reach a certain body size, tyrannosaurs rocket up in terms of mechanical strength compared to other giant carnivores. And this is consistent with the idea that they changed their diet from small-bodied animals to giant animals at a certain life stage. Or it doesn't just have to be jaws. You know, claws and feet and legs are mechanical structures. And so a couple years ago, Bishop, uh, Peter Bishop looked at trying to test different hypotheses of the sickle claw on the feet of, on the foot of Deinonychus. And so these are some of the inputs, you know, different angles uh, of the claws, um, different loadings in terms of the muscles, different postures of the different limb elements, and going through a bunch of different hypotheses and different expected loadings, and found um, that the prey restraint model, rather than, say, slash kicking to rip open something or riding on prey or whatever, um, but the play, play restraint was the one that put the less, the least amount of strong forces on the claw, suggesting it's the one that's easiest to do, uh, and therefore likely the primary function, which is consistent with earlier work uh, that this is the ripper paper. Um, and although I know in this case it actually is riding, but this is a, a sort of a smaller situation. This is really ripper going on, raptor prey restraint. It's just the iguanodon's not, I'm sorry, the iguana, not iguanodon, the iguana's not having any of it. Eventually it succumbs. But of course the main thing people are interested in, in terms of hind limbs, isn't killing, it's locomotion. Now, dinosaurs are a good subject for the study of locomotion for a number of reasons. One, they're awesome. And two, they're big. At least some of them are big. And it's a, it may represent sort of the, the extremes of terrestrial locomotion. But also, dinosaur locomotion is relatively simple. Remember, by the change of the, uh, the way their femur fits in to the acetabulum, the orientation of their limbs and so forth, their locomotion is mostly restricted, or what it was and is mostly restricted, to anteroposterior motions along the legs. They're not swinging the legs out, doing all sorts of complicated things with their knees and ankles and so forth. They're simple striders for the most part. And that makes it easier to model. Now, of course, one of the main things we're interested in locomotion is maximal speed. But of course, if we, if we get a value of maximum speed, what do we compare it to? Uh, and it turns out that there's only a handful of species for which we actually know the maximum speed. You're seeing them. That's pretty much it. Despite what you've seen in, you know, if you see on Discovery Channel or read in the book, these are them, pretty much. There's a handful of others, but not many. That's because people don't actually study this rigorously that much in living animals. So this side... You know, this, these are sport animals, or human beings. Um, we have, well, we're animals, and we engage in sports, so I suppose that's, that's a case. Where we can actually, there is big money, vast money to be made in figuring out, first of all, how fast you're moving, and to figure out how to make people, people or other animals move faster. And so these are the maximum speeds recorded so far of humans, but that's Usain Bolt, and I think the vast majority of us probably couldn't even get half that. Um, so, um, and so, you know, one human out of almost eight billion, superbly trained at the peak of his, uh, his physical ability on specialized equipment, that is running shoes, on a specialized track. So, although humans can achieve 12.27 meters per second, the vast majority of us will never see anything like that. And in this case, it's not, you know, a beagle is not going to get to 19.2 meters per second. That's a, a specially bred greyhound on special race tracks and thoroughbred horses getting up that speed. Now, there are a handful of wild animals for which we know the speed. In the case of cheetah, oh, I forgot an N. I keep on leaving that N out. It's, it's asynonics, not asionics. Um, the fastest land animal we know of Cheetahs, at least, 
are somewhat amenable to running under controlled circumstances. <laughs> so you can, you can actually record their, app, their, their known speed the way we can for dogs and horses. Those other two, the pronghorn and on top the ostrich, um, you can't really train a pronghorn, but people have studied them closely enough to get that's about the speed they're going. Ostriches, you actually can train somewhat. Um, other types of wild animals, when you hear like, what's the speed of a wildebeest? I'm gonna let you in on a secret. This is how they figure it out. They don't actually, maybe they should by, by now, but they don't, you know, put the little radar gun on it and track it. Although that would be actually kind of good, like the, you know, the cops waiting to get you at a speed trap. What they do is they're out on the Serengeti, you're driving aloud, hey, that wildebeest, we're about the same speed as it in our Land Rover. How fast are we going? 27 miles an hour. Okay, it's going 27 miles an hour. That's the maximum speed of a wildebeest. That's how that's done. You know, it's not that under controlled, rigorous experimental lab conditions. So how the heck are we going to figure out how fast an extinct animal goes? I mean, we know how fast it's going now. They're easy to clock. Zero meters per second. But, um, so we have to look at other aspects of locomotion and maybe get to maximal speed. So, for instance, let's think about what it means in terms of, of, of locomotion in general. So there's a, a, in biomechanics and locomotion studies, there's this concept of duty factor the fraction of the step cycle that each foot is on the ground. So standing, it's, you know, 1.0. Um, and flying, it's zero. Um, the classic definition of the different types of gates that animals use is often related to the duty factor. And so people would say that, an, and the classic definition, that an animal is running when there is a suspended phase when all the feet are off the ground. So rhinos run under that definition. There are phases of their locomotion where all their feet are off the ground. Elephants do not. There's no part of the elephant walk cycle, elephant motion cycle, where all their feet are off the ground. And so some people say elephants don't run. They just walk really fast. However, Biomechanicists are actually interested in something a little different these days. And that is what they call a kinetic definition. And for that, running is a bouncy spring locomotion, a compliant form of locomotion. It's a form of locomotion where your leg is most compressed at the middle of its contact with the ground, like a pogo stick, rather than at its longest. Under that definition, elephants can run. Now, if you want to test this yourself, you can do it, you know, at home or, you know, anywhere. Because if you're walking along, walking in place, at the middle of the step cycle, your head is no lower than else at other, any other time. But when you're running in place, even if you're doing super slow running, you're at your lowest at the middle of the step cycle. So compliant, bouncy locomotion running, non-compliant walking. Now, most of the study of locomotion has centered on mammals. Makes sense, we are mammals. Most of the animals we work with are mammals and they tend to be easier to train. Um, and so, for instance, you know, we have, just to use some of the names, sort of a, a low-speed locomotion, walking and loping, mid-speed, trotting or pacing or jogging, and then faster locomotion, running, cantering, galloping. And in mammals, there is normally a phase shift, an actual gait transition, that shows a marked difference from one to another. So you see this kitty go from a trot to a run, or a, sort of a bounding run. So there it is trotting, and then it's bounding. And so a question arose, did non-avian dinosaurs have gait transitions? And the reason the question arose is because birds don't. Bird, birds, modern birds, shift 
gradually and continuously from walk, slow walking to medium walking to fast walking to running. And there's no distinct change in there. It's eventually, they go from really fast walking <laughs> into running um, without a real change in the way the body's moving very much. Now, we would expect phylogenetically that non-avian dinosaurs would do that. But remember that change in the anatomy. Modern birds and their cousins among humani raptorans have that reorientation that most of their power is coming at the knee and not from the caudofemoralis muscle from the femur to the tail. Most groups of dinosaurs have the muscles running from the femur. So their locomotion, in some, the, the posture rather of the leg, is more similar to a mammal than a bird. And so we might think, aha, maybe they'll show a mammalian pattern. Now, in the modern world, we can study creatures like ourselves and look at the transition between humans walking and humans running. And what we see is a distinct difference at what is this? That's the space between, or actually down here. That's up there too. The space between the feet as they're contacting the ground. As we walk, our feet are further apart, and when we're running, our feet are closer to the midline, and as we switch over, there's a dramatic change. In birds, we don't see that. In birds, we see the feet coming closer and closer and closer to the midline gradually, not a distinct change from one gait to another. And so, uh, this team looked at some dinosaur tracks. I've actually shown you the site before when they did that, this is a picture I took of it back in the early 90s. It's my dad, actually, way up there. Um, and uh, down in Culpeper, Virginia, which has a big, lot, lot, huge database. And they found that these coelophysoid grade theropods show the bird pattern. So even though they had a more vertically oriented femur, they're moving more like a Man, uh, more like a bird than a mammal, at least in terms of gait transition, and that birds, sorry, that not even dinosaurs, would have gone from sort of a slow walk to a medium walk to a fast walk, you know, speed walking basically, power walking, speed walking, to a run. So, can we approach this issue of locomotion with other data? Well, we can. We can try with functional morphology, and that's estimating, calculating, and inferring how different parts of the anatomy operated using the data from mechanics and comparisons with modern animals. Now, due to various limitations, we're, well, I say, unlikely to give us actual numerical values. We might actually get the numerical value from it. It's just our ability to say if that's a realistic numerical value uh, or a precise one that is narrowly constrained might be limited. But we might be able to say something about whether the locomotion is more cursorial, so that it's adapted towards running, or gravity portal, which is adapted to slow movement. And so for the rest of this lecture, and it's going to spill over onto uh, uh, on Friday, but that's okay. This part of the course, that's fine. We're going to take a look at this. So in the modern world, we see grades of cursoriality. So tortoises are just gravity portal. They don't do anything that approaches a run, such as giant Galapagos tortoise. Elephants, they can walk really fast. They technically can run in a compliant phase somewhat. Um, but they are not particularly cursorial. They are essentially more gravity portal. Rhinos sort of in the middle. And then things like cheetahs and pronghorns, the two fastest living quadrupeds, uh, are most definitely cursorial adapted animals whose, in fact, much of their anatomy and physiology is geared towards the ability to have extreme speeds. But what about dinosaurs? You know, can we figure out which ones are which? So, you know, here is from a recent paper. Um, especially the issue here is size. Because when we're dealing with the interesting dinosaurs for the most part, and that's one of the main reasons, pe pe reasons people study this issue, is we're talking about animals that greatly exceed living large-bodied animals. <coughs> and 
And so what is going on here? We can look at some of their adaptations. And for instance, we see that big sauropods are basically gravity portal. Tyrannosaurids have a lot of attributes that are cursorial, but are they really that fast, especially at full body size? And much like rhinos today, which are sort of in the midway between the two, same thing for ceratopsians. They're not really cursorial, but they're not really gravity portal either. Now, science is important because we have to deal with scaling issues. In this case, I'm not talking about integument. I'm talking about uh, size. And so one important aspect is, you know, here's a, an animal that happens to be shaped like a cube. It has a length of one on each side. One what? Doesn't matter. At any given cross section, so its base or halfway through, if we're concerned with bending or something, it's one times one. It's an easy calculation to do. And the total mass is, a, is related to volume. So its volume is one times one times one. Not surprisingly, it's one. Now we find an individual or a species that's double the length. Its cross sectional area is at 4, 2 times 2, but its total mass is 8, 2 times 2 times 2. So the amount of mass over area, so the amount of stress, for instance, at any plane on it or at the base, is twice as much as the one with the length of 1. And at 3, it goes up to 3, and so on and so forth. The larger the organism, The amount of mass supported by any given surface or get any given cross section increases faster. And therefore, the mechanical strength of the overall animal decreases because it's made of the same material. It's not like bone of a giant animal is made of a different stuff than bone of a small animal, or that muscle of a giant animal is made of a different stuff than a small animal. So the mechanical strength decreases overall as the organisms get bigger and bigger and bigger. We will see other aspects of scaling issue when we talk about physiology as well. And so this results in a pattern that's long been known to modern functional morphologists. And that is in terms of speed. You get faster and faster among animals as you get bigger, from tiny to large, in part because you're, you're getting able to cover more ground per stride, and you can have some big ass muscles and so forth. But eventually, generally between the 100 and 1,000 kilogram range, so 220 pounds to a ton, that's where you max out. And then from that point on, it, well, it's actually from you know, about 100, it begins to decline. And when you're over 1,000, you're dealing with animals which are much slower because of their hitting sort of mechanical limits. Now, one big aspect of changes of size isn't merely overall size, but it's proportion. Body parts typically do not grow at the same rate either through ontogeny, and here we see examples of ontogeny, or through phylogeny. So an adult human is, does not have the proportions of a baby, which is great because otherwise we'd be freaks with gigantic heads and stumpy little limbs and so forth. Um, and sometimes these have developmental controls, but often they have mechanical factors which are controlling it. Now, within allometry, oh, this, this, this pattern so is called allometry, difference of measure, allometry. There are three general patterns of allometry, and we'll see examples of all of these as we go along. Isometry is where the body part growth grows directly in proportion to increase in mass. It turns out, for instance, that femur length grows largely isometrically in dinosaurs. However, many parts of the organism grow with negative allometry. They grow proportionally slower than overall body size. So in the case of this Tyrannosaurus, or indeed in almost all dinosaurs, not all non-avian dinosaurs, the metatarsus grows with negative allometry. It continues to grow. The adult 
metatarsus is much longer in absolute value than this juvenile, but when we compare them to the same length, you know, we rescale the bottom one to the same length, and proportionately has a much longer one. So the metatarsus is growing slower than overall body size. But there's also positive allometry, where a body part grows proportionally faster than overall size, in this case, tooth size. An adult Tyrannosaurus has teeth which are proportionally larger than those in a juvenile. So isometry, negative allometry, positive allometry. Now when we look at modern organisms, we see over the spectrum that gravity portal or organisms tend to have stubbier distal limb bones, shorter, squatter, uh, especially metapodials. What are metapodials? Those are metatars those are metatarsals or metacarpals. In the case of a biped, we're only concerned with the metatarsals, but since we're talking about quadrupeds here, here as well, the metacarpals as well. Also, and in contrast, cursorial ones tend to have long metacarpals and metatarsals. Gravity portal animals tend to have broad metapodials. Maybe the individual metapodial isn't that thick, but the whole section, the metacarpus and the metatarsus, is broad, and that's to sort of spread the weight out. In contrast, cursorial animals tend to have very narrow, sometimes locked together, metapodials. Gravity portal animals tend to have very long toes, or maybe short toes, but big, broad foot pads. In both cases, it's trying to increase the contact area with the ground to support weight. In contrast, cursorial animals tend to have shorter toes, trying to decrease the weight at the end of the limbs. And gravity portal animals tend to have muscles that run all the way down the legs. You can see, this is not fat. This is, this is muscle going down on the legs here. Well, okay, there's fat in there as well. In cursorial animals, you try to get the muscles concentrated up near the trunk, near the, near the torso or hips. And in a lot of the cases, these attributes are trying to, res trying to reduce the weight at the end of your limb. If you think about it, you want to maximize your running ability when you're out on the track. You don't want to wear heavy boots with like iron soles. Because that's going to, you know, it's going to be really heavy when you're going along. Maybe that might be useful in some situations. But with running, you want as little weight as possible at the end of the feet so you can swing that foot out faster, recover it, and keep on going. And animals do the same sort of thing. So in general, it turns out femora grow isometrically, and tibiae, shins, and metatarsi, feet, grow with negative allometry. And that's true both for ontogenetic changes, like we see here in Tyrannosaurus, but it can happen phylogenetically. So here we see, in the case, from an early Tyrannosauroid to a Tyrannosaurid. And so if we see organisms who evolutionarily shift and where they get longer metatarsi than expected, and longer tibiae than expected, as we go up in size and as we go up in phylogeny, that suggests there's evolution, evolution towards increased cursoriality. So the selection is operating towards running. In contrast, if we see a shift where evolutionarily we're getting shorter than expected distal limb bones for the same body size, that suggests evolution is favoring gravity portality. And here we see Skeletosaurus, a primitive thyreophoran, and Duophilocephalus, a derived ankylosaurian ankylosaur, with its short stubby legs. That suggests that gravity portality is what's being selected for. So that's where I'll stop for now. We will pick up next time by looking at the expression of these sorts of things in different groups of dinosaurs and get to the answer of what were the fastest dinosaurs. Uh, and then we'll move on to other aspects of behavior.